uh, Chris Eubank Jr. We know you've spoken about him quite a lot uh, over the past. So it was quite, uh, it was well highlighted that he was waiting to see what the Conor Ben situation was going to be because he was possibly going to take that rematch. But he, before the result came out, he decided to take Liam Smith on. So he's fighting him rematches uh, in a few weeks. Um, but the big surprise to everyone is the fact that he's, uh, he's split with Roy Jones Jr. and he's got, now got Bo Mack in his camp, uh, Terence Crawford's trainer. Uh, what do you make of that link-up? Do you think it's the right link-up? And uh, uh, style-wise, looking at, you know, you've been up against Bo Mack before, you've had some good banter with each other. Uh, how do you think that's going to unfold? I think, you know, Bo Mack's, uh, especially with the fight against Spence, cemented himself, as firmly cemented himself as the trainer for, for Terence Crawford. And in that, in that relationship, it's easy to see that, you know, without a doubt, the talent is Crawford. Um, and obviously, Bormack's got something that keeps him on track and keeps him focused or whatever. He's not kind of replicated that with anybody else. And, you know, people could turn around and say that, well, you know, same for you, you realistically kill Brooke. But I've, I, I have actually trained other fighters, um, myself and also with my dad over, over the years. Um, you know, and whether I train anybody else to that level again, you know, who knows? But when you look at Eubank, he went to Roy Jones and trained under Roy Jones, and it seems a big switch where if you look at Roy Jones, who was a fantastic boxer, obviously untested as a trainer, he trained uh, Chris for a few fights, and for me, never really, you know, it never really benefited him. And I don't think that's because of Roy Jones. I just think Chris, Chris Eubank, and I think with this, this recent move, going to bore Mac thinking that he's going to sprinkle some magic dust on him and make him a, you know what I mean, make him um, a Crawford in like six or seven weeks. It's just a ridiculous notion. Why would you even do that? You need to be working at least, you know, three to six months with a fighter uh, in a big fight to get him to, uh, to know him, and, you know, don't, don't, didn't Eubank look and think, well, it didn't work for Amir Khan. You know, Amir Khan probably thought that he was going to give him a psychological advantage over Kel because, you know, Crawford beat Kel and that's his train. I think that was all part of it. But you've got to understand that don't really work in boxing like that, especially with somebody like Kel. So it kind of backfired there. And I, I, I did speak to Khan afterwards and he goes, yeah, it probably wasn't the right move for me. With Bormack and I, you know, Eubank doing that, it's very, I don't know, it's immature in a way, isn't it? It's like you think after all this time he'd learn that the book stops with him, it's down to him, and he's kind of relying on everybody else. Look at his dad, his dad was trained by Ronnie Davis, and Ronnie Davis never had any great success before Chris Eubank senior, and he never really had any success afterwards, big success, not as much as he did again with Chris. But he was with Eubank all the way through his career, which was a very successful career. So, you know. Is there any British trainers he could have potentially gone with, do you think? I'd, well, do you know, I'll be honest with you. That I don't think any respected British trainer would want to train him because you're going to be compromising yourself again. Do you know what I mean? It's like, who would want to train him? Does, does you, he... I mean, you know, we, I, I think... Ideally, a, a good trainer for him would be probably Joe Gallagher. But it's only going to be good if he listens, and I just don't think he listens. That's the thing, I don't think he listens. I think, you know, whether he is really arrogant, truly arrogant, or it's just a show, I don't know. You know, a lot of people have said about that about Chris. It's quite a common consensus he doesn't listen. But is it fair to say, even based on that statement, whether he listens or not, he's done pretty well for his career, hasn't he? If he's kind of just been winging it, doing it himself, and kind of just having whoever in his corner, he's had a successful career. He's obviously a millionaire. He's, well, for pay-per-view. Well, all right, then. The thing is, people's perception of Chris Eubank Jr. is that because his dad box, he's up here. His ability is here and he's operating here. That's what's happening. So that's what people's perception of his ability is. This is what his ability is, yeah? And because he's operated above his ability, but not up to what he sh people think he should be, he's had an all right career because he's kind of made money mm. being, and I'll say it, mediocre, mm. because... Again, looking at it as a neutral, he's, from what I've seen, he's fought on every TV network, yeah, he's started on Channel 5, me, me, he's fought pay, headline pay-per-view, he's going to retire as a millionaire. Well, 
Because obviously, obviously you've got the, you've had the IBO belt, which some people don't recognise mm. as a world title, but would you say that's a successful career if you're retiring with yeah, all your faculties, any money? He's had a successful career, of course he has. Mm. But everybody expected him to absolutely flatten Liam Smith. Mm. And I don't think many people give Liam Smith a chance, but people asked me and I said, the difference is Liam Smith's come from a a very good amateur background through all the amateurs, the competitions. He's got a, you know, a very good grounded style. I've had people spar him. And he did six or seven rounds with Canelo and he only got done with a body shot and he took some big shots off him. So, you know, it was a big upset. Thinking, bearing in mind that uh, Chris Eubank Jr. had kind of uh, he boxed Liam, Liam, Liam Williams, had him down three or four times and won the fight, the, the fight previously, didn't he? Now, Liam Williams boxed Liam Smith, they were close fights, whatever. Um, you know, I think it would have been a good fight with Liam Williams and Liam Smith when I were training Liam Williams, because I think he would have beat Liam Smith. So on all that kind of mix, you would think, you know, Chris Eubanks did an easy enough job, easy enough job on Liam Williams, although... If it hadn't been for the knockdowns, Liam Williams could have probably won that fight because he kind of backpedaled for about six rounds, Eubanks, at the end of that. The, the knockdowns got him in front. So you think with the way people perceived him beating Liam Williams, it would have been on the cards, well, he's going to beat, he's going to beat Liam Smith, and he didn't. He got flattened. So where's, where's it all gone wrong there? Do you know what I mean? What's, what's happening? So I don't think, it doesn't matter who trains him, and, you know, I don't think any British trainer would want to train him because I think if you've got any sense of British training, you think, why would I want to train him? I don't think he listens. Just because he's, he's, he's had the fights, a lot of that has been because of his name. Because people, he is a fighter that people love to, love to hate in a way, and that's where he, he, he draws the views. So he's done well from that aspect of it. But, you know, is he going to say around in his career and say, well, you know what, I did all right because I blagged everybody and I still made money? Or does he actually believe he's a good fighter? I don't know. But he's, he's, he's changed his trainers so many times and he's never really cemented it. I don't particularly think he's cemented himself in boxing. Let's see how that concludes the fights in a few weeks. Uh, the, the last thing I want to speak to you about, uh, Dom, it, we, we covered it quite extensively, if, you know, like a year ago now. Conor Ben situation, it appears to be reaching its conclusion. And from my understanding, looking into it, so, so he's had a, a case with UCAD uh, and himself um, with the National Anti-Doping Agency overlooking it all. And then the way it appears is the National Anti-Doping Agency overruled UCAD and basically said that um, you're going to have to suspend, uh, cancel the suspension that you put on him. So um, what does that say? Does that tell us that UCAD were wrong from day one? And if they were, uh, how does a, a, a drugs governing body make such a massive balls up and stop somebody's career for so long? Because that, that's the first question I've got, because it, it don't add up. Well, let's look at another thing. Governments of the world make massive balls up, don't they? You know? You look at, you look at like, even the Kobe situation when they're having parties in Downing Street or when Kobe's going on. If that's going on at that level, well, it's going to go on at all levels, isn't it? It's, it's always going to be human error. You would have thought, though, that they would have, you know, really thoroughly, you know, done the job properly. And this is, this is the problem. It's like the old Conor Ben situation is a banned substance was found in the system. Yeah, that's correct. And... I'll say it again and again and again. It's not black and white doping or, or bans. There's always a grey area. The first, the, 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 you know, they find out there's a banned substance and it's, it's how to deal with it. And realistically, that particular substance that he had, you know, when people are putting up pictures of him being in tremendous shape and an animal, and it's down to that, it's, it's just a load of rubbish, realistically. But they still have to go through the process of, you know... Um, dealing with it and when you look back how they deal with cases it, it's mostly consistent but there's a lot of inconsistency with UCAD and they're an agency who I think they get funded off the government or whatever they do so they've got to be seen to be doing the job so it's, it makes sense that the more positive cases they get they're doing the job so they get funded for so many more years or whatever but it's probably far from ideal so you know, they've been overruled by another organisation over, overseeing them. And I think, like you said before, that 
they've, they've kind of said you've actually got no jurisdiction in this because you weren't the doping agency involved, it was VADA. VADA have to give the results to the WBC who, de who decide what the punishment is. But you've taken it on yourself because he's a, a UK fighter, what's doping is managed by UCAD, that you've seen fit to, to issue, issue a ban. Now you would have thought they would have known what the procedure is. You would have thought that. And the other thing is you would have thought that somebody, somewhere in the system, legal wise, solicitors, Eddie or whatever would have thought, wait a minute, we, it's not a, particularly a loophole, they, you would, they would have got onto that a lot sooner. It does seem that way because they were, you know, Connor was always confident, Eddie has constantly yeah, said he a lot wasn't of interviews. Like that from the off though. Yeah. He wasn't like that from the off. They were very confident that he'd, he'd be cleared. And do you think the reason behind that was because that, that you know, people are calling no, it a technicality? No, 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 I think the, you've got to be, you've, you, I think in all these cases, you know, it's like Dillian White saying, putting out that positive. He's not going to say, well, to be honest, I've already failed two tests and, you know, it's really, I've got a track record for it. So I don't see much hope for myself. He's turned and said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a clean fighter and gone through that same spiel. But people will be thinking, well, I'm not being funny, Dilly, and you've already failed two before. Your track record suggests that you've done it again. That's what people say. So I don't actually think that they knew Condomin, because if they did, I think they'd have got on it a lot sooner and got it sorted a lot sooner. Because uh, my understanding is, like you said there, uh, Varda, you know, went to the WBC, the WBC did the investigation and they basically cleared him and accepted yeah. that, you know, it could have been from eggs, etc. Then UCAD stepped in, suspended him from fighting. And obviously that's gone on for quite a while. And now that, you know, the National Doping Agency have basically said, hang on a minute, you're going to have to suspend that. Um, you're going to have to cancel your suspension of him. Um, because you haven't so, really got the jurisdiction exactly. to do Exactly, so he's, he's now not fought for this long. And mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Nelson did an interview this the other day, and he suggested, well, they've kind of robbed him of his earnings and fighting, etc. And I know a lot of people in the comments are like, you know, kind of uh, saying he's guilty and he's getting off with the technicality, etc. But, but in reality, that's what's happened, isn't it? The WBC cleared him, and then UK had stepped in and said, hang on a minute, we're going to suspend you till we do our own investigation, mm. when they had no jurisdiction. So some, somebody in that organisation of UCAD, between UCAD and the boxing board and everything else, they've got it wrong, haven't they? There's, there's got to be, there's obviously clear rules. It, it, dead easy, so, you know, who's, who's not paying attention? That's the thing. So if they're making slip-ups like that, and then you look at the situation where... You know, Dillian White in his second failed drug test where they said it was, you know, um, contamination. And then you look at Tyson Fury years back when, you know, he got banned and he dragged it out and it got legal and everything else. And, you know, he did his two year ban, then he were back and it were, you know, he did a contaminated wild boar for the Nandrolone. And it's like, it's all a bit, you know, it's all a bit up in the air, really. And, and, and for, for that kind of, uh, mistakes been made, yeah. It's it probably has kind of psychologically ruined Conor Ben. It has, you know, stifled his career. It has cast a shadow over his name. And and but who's going to really be brought to book for that? Nobody really. Nobody in that organisation is going to get sacked, fired. In the government, if you do something wrong and you get found out, well, you know, you have to resign, don't you? So who's gonna who's gonna it's like, well, you're going to like, you're gonna have to lump it then. Because who's, who's going who's gonna to stand up and be the scapegoat for that one? What about the fact that, you know, when the information was leaked, because we, we read a lot and we've seen from interviews that, you know, Eddie Ennell say that UCAD are very private and they keep stuff, you know, even the Boxing Board said it the other day in their statement that the uh, UCAD keep everything in-house and they don't disclose any information. But we know when the results came out, only UCAD could have known. So someone in UCAD has sold a story to, you know, I think it might be the Daily Mail, um, so someone's selling stories, you know, I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in a drug agency, is, is well, that right? Well, but there's, but there's, but there's corruption in, in all aspects of life, that's the thing. And because, look, if Conor Ben hadn't got the backing of Eddie Earn and backing of uh, and money behind him, he, he would have been, you know, he probably would have been banned. And that's what happens it's, in all aspects of life, that money gets you through certain situations. Look at O.J. Simpson case years ago. Well, I'll give you a best example. Liam Cameron, you know, local fighter who got a four-year ban for taking cocaine, yeah. which is not performance enhancing. He's obviously took it because he had a drug issue. He's got a four-year ban and he's, I believe he's training that for a comeback. 
it, nothing seems to really ever add up. Cocaine is, 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 can be a performance enhancing drug because the way it happens with cocaine is, is you wouldn't take cocaine as a stimulant to fight on because you'd just be too erratic. But the reason that whether you've got a problem or not, some athletes actually take cocaine to suppress their appetite, as daft as it sounds. And the old cocaine situation in boxing is that athletes take it maybe five or six days before they box, which is a bit stupid. And the metabolites trickle over into the, uh, to the test after the fight. And you've got to kind of prove that you didn't actually take it on the day of the fight. You have to kind of say, talk about amounts and they look at this. And so you didn't use it to enhance your performance. So he turned around and said, I think he turned around and said something like, if I remember rightly, somebody was, somebody was selling his tickets, were dealing in drugs, and it was on the cash that they passed to him. And he got it in his hands and ate his food and he went going to his system that way. It's very possible that could have happened. But, you know, it's probably very possible it happened because they can, the, the way they test these, they can find micro amounts. Mm. And it is possible that people who watch boxing probably do take drugs or they might be drug dealers or whatever. But I've seen many a toilets at boxing shows. Yeah, so, but realistically, how difficult is that going to be for him to prove? Very difficult. And if you kind of getting funded on results, well, sorry, Liam, like, unless you're going to put up a fight, pal, it's a four-year ban. Yes. So, you know, that's four years of his career wasted, yeah. and, and you have to feel sorry for him, because it, maybe if he had a big name behind him, it might not have got a four-year ban. Maybe if he'd have been advised better, I don't know. But it's, it's like that in all aspects of life, isn't it? That if you've got, you know, you can force a situation through the courts and you've got the money to do it, you're going to stand a better chance than somebody who hasn't got the you know, the money to do it. That's very true. And uh, he, like I said, he's on the comeback trail. If people want to follow his journey, check him out on Instagram because he's lost a lot of weight. Uh, and the last thing with regards to Conor Ben, uh, is obviously he can't get the Chris Eubank Jr. fight anymore. It looks like he will fight imminently. I'm assuming he'll have a warm-up fight. Uh, but it's quite obvious that he, he's called that Kelbrook. He's saying he'll stop Kelbrook in four rounds uh, and put him back into retirement. Um, have you spoken to Kel about this? You know, it, it, because you said to me before, the only fight you definitely would be interested in is the Conor Ben fight, and now it looks like there's nothing stopping it from happening. Well, I, I, listen, I don't know what the, the situation is with that fight, and it's Conor Ben to knock Kel Brook out in four rounds. Well, the only person who's managed to, to do that is, is, is Crawford, and I'll tell you about that fight. Kel didn't have the best training camp for that fight. I didn't train him, and he didn't train long enough he wasn't in cam long enough, um, so you know he got the win, Crawford. It was kind of a flattering result, really. Conor Ben is nowhere near the level of of Crawford, and Kel simply hasn't diminished that much um, for Conor Ben uh, to be able to do that. Now, who's a bigger puncher, Conor Ben or Kel Brook? Well, I'll tell you one thing: it's certainly not Conor Ben. So let's say that. Kells all of a sudden lost his ability to take a punch. Not that he's taken many big punches in his career, because he's quite good at not getting it, although he has been it, but not a lot. Got all his faculties. He's been in yesterday sparring, and with a young kid sparring, only very steady, and he's still got the power, the timing, and the speed. What it comes down to Kells Brook is whether he's got the desire anymore to carry and doing what he's doing, the will to win, yeah, they had that big altercation in Dublin. Yeah. So, when Kel boxed Amir Khan, when he boxed Sean Porter, the fights that Kel really got motivated, motivated for were the ones that he really had a bee in his bonnet about, that he really wanted to make, uh, you know, an example of. And the trouble with the situation with Conor Ben is they, they sparred before the Crawford fight. Uh, probably when Kel was making weight and all these other factors. And Kel never really looks fantastic in sparring anyway. In all the times I've ever trained him, he's never looked fantastic in sparring. He just gets the work he needs to get done. He don't look to win rounds. He just tends to practice what he needs to practice, get through the rounds, because he's continually making weight and cutting weight. So he's never really got the energy to put in good spars. So 
if Conor Ben for any reason is thinking that the sparring session he had with Kel, you know, previous to the Crawford fight is something to measure by, the Kel Brook that gets in the ring on a fight night is, is a totally different animal to the Kel Brook who trains in camp and spars. Because I've seen very mediocre people give Kel good spars. But when it comes to fight night, it's a different ball game altogether. And Conor Ben's what, 25? Is he 26? Kel's 37. He hadn't boxed for a year and a half. You know, well, if Conor Ben thinks he's going to knock him out in four rounds, go for it. But I'd, I'd be very, very, very surprised if he could manage that. He hasn't got the footwork. He might have got a bit of power. He hasn't got the footwork to get into a position to land that shot on Kel Brook. Interesting. Well, if it happens, I'll be intrigued. Um, and I'll, I'll be here, I'll hopefully. Uh, when, when should, we, should we do a prediction on that fight if it happens? Go on, I'll, I'll give you a prediction. Kel Brook will beat Conor Ben. How? More than likely stop him. Early or late? Maybe six to eight rounds. Interesting. I'll see what Con has to say about that.